Thank you for joining today's Acquisition Learning Seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled Key Elements of Past Performance, Information and Best Practices for Reporting Timely and Quality Evaluations, features great presenters from the Office of Management and Budget, Departments of the Navy, Defense, Treasury, and Homeland Security, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and the Environmental Protection Agency. The Federal Acquisition Workforce is pressed to be efficient and fiscally responsible when planning, sourcing, selecting, and awarding contracts and orders to contractors. Great efforts have been made to improve past performance guidance and establish new tools to help agencies improve their reporting. Leveraging these tools and sharing agency best practices for the timely reporting of quality past performance information will only increase agencies' ability to deliver better outcomes and increase productivity on behalf of the American taxpayer. This seminar will provide an overview of key elements of past performance information, as well as the tools and systems that are available for past performance reporting and reviewing. We will learn how agencies ensure that one, their acquisition workforce understands their role in the past performance process, two, their workforce reports past performance information in a timely manner, and three, all performance issues, mitigation steps, and resolutions are accurately documented in the performance systems and made transparent to the contractor during the period of performance. We will learn this from Julia Wise, Acquisition Regulatory Manager and Senior Procurement Analyst, Office of Federal Procurement Policy, Office of Management and Budget, Doreen Powell, Quality Assurance Specialist, Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System Program Management Office, Naval Sea Logistics Center, the Department of the Navy, Richard Jinman, Director, Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy, Department of Defense, William McNally, Assistant Administrator, Office of Procurement, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Iris Cooper, Senior Procurement Executive, Department of the Treasury, John Bashista, Director, Office of Administration and Resources Management, Environmental Protection Agency, and Laura Alletta, Executive Director of Procurement Policy and Oversight, Department of Homeland Security. Before we begin, allow me to explain a few administrative items. First, the Federal Acquisition Institute is recording this seminar. The video, as well as the material you see today, will be posted in the video library on FAI.gov. You should be able to access these items in one to two weeks. Second, we usually ask you to submit questions using the link on this page so we can hold a live question and answer session with our presenters at the end of the seminar. However, our agenda is too full for that today. Instead, we would ask that you submit questions or concerns related to past performance you wish to see addressed in future training offerings. And now, let's get started. It is my distinct honor to introduce Leslie Field. Ms. Field is the Deputy Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy in the Office of Management and Budget, Executive Office of the President, and is currently serving as the Acting Administrator, a position she has held periodically since 2008. Prior to joining the Office of Management and Budget, Ms. Field served at the U.S. Department of Transportation as a Contracting Officer in the Office of the Secretary. Ms. Field is also a Fellow of the National Academy of Public Administration and a 2008 winner of the Fed 100 Award. Let's go to her now. Hello, I'm Leslie Field, the Acting Administrator for Federal Procurement Policy in the Office of Management and Budget, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Acquisition Learning Seminar on Past Performance. Over the past five years, OFPP has placed great emphasis on reporting compliance and the use of past performance information to ensure taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely. Most recently, in 2013, we set aggressive targets to improve timely reporting, and I'm pleased to report that every one of the CFO Act agencies has improved. We've also worked with the Federal Acquisition Regulatory Council to develop a central reporting tool and standardized evaluation factors and rating criteria to require that all agency procedures include clear roles and responsibilities and to make performance information immediately available to other source selection officials. We will continue to make regulatory policy and systems changes to improve the collection and use of this information. And today's session is designed to reinforce the value of getting and sharing performance assessments. 
Before the seminar begins, I'd like to quickly explain why we are focusing on not only improving reporting compliance, but also on how to use this information in your source selection decisions. Past performance is one of the most relevant factors that a selection official should consider in awarding a contract. The evaluation of contractor performance and the use of those evaluations and decisions for future awards motivates contractors to perform well, helps ensure that we don't do repeat business with firms that don't perform, and this is especially important on high-risk, complex acquisitions. We also want to be sure we're able to tap the innovation that new entrants, those with little or no federal experience, can bring to the table. Many agencies have established policies that require their acquisition workforce to consider relevant information from other agencies, commercial customers, state and local governments, and even foreign governments, if doing so would provide constructive information about performance risks or issues that may be associated with a particular business. Selection officials are encouraged to conduct more outreach, for example, call a colleague, do more research online, and use other sources of information, especially for new entrants, so that we get a good picture. Agencies are doing more than ever to improve reporting so that the performance system includes useful and quality information. You will hear strategies and practices today from some of our key senior leaders, so I encourage you to take notes and share with us your practices that may or may not have been mentioned today. Once collected, we will share your improvement strategies across the government with other acquisition practitioners. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julia Wise and I am with the Office of Federal Procurement Policy. As Ms. Fields mentioned, today's session will provide valuable information about past performance. You will also hear senior acquisition leaders discuss their agency best practices. These are practices they have implemented within their agencies to improve the timely reporting of quality performance information into the systems. For many acquisition professionals, this information will refresh your knowledge of this topic. And for some, this information will be new. But for everyone, we hope that this session emphasizes the importance of using past performance information effectively during the source selection process and when managing contractor performance, and also when documenting quality performance information into the system. Today's session will cover background information, policies, and regulations, and discuss main elements of past performance information. You will hear about the what, why, when, and who is responsible for reporting timely and quality information. You will also hear about the past performance information systems, where information is reported and how quality information is reported into the systems. There will be five key agencies, such as Department of Defense, including Navy, Department of Homeland Security, the Environmental Protection Agency, NASA, Department of Treasury, will be here to discuss their best practices for reporting timely and quality information into the system. Primarily, they will focus on the areas of accountability, compliance, and transparency. First, let's start with the long history associated with past performance. The OFPP Act of 1974 required the OFPP administrator to prescribe guidance regarding the consideration of past performance of offerers in awarding contracts. Specifically, it required the policies and procedures to establish standards for evaluating past performance with respect to cost, when appropriate, schedule, compliance with technical or functional specifications, and other relevant performance factors that facilitate consistent and fair evaluation by all executive agencies. It also required policies for the collection and maintenance of information on past pe contract performance that, to a maximum extent practical, facilitate automated collection, maintenance, and dissemination of information, and provide for ease of collection, maintenance, and dissemination of information by other methods as necessary. It also required policies for ensuring that offerers are afforded an opportunity to submit relevant information on past contract performance, including performance under contracts entered into by executive agencies concerned by other, by other agencies, state and local governments, and by commercial customers, and that self, such information is considered. The policies were also required to include the period for which past performance information may be maintained. Then we also have the Federal Acquisition Streamlining Act of 1994, which is known as FASA. FASA was designed to eliminate red tape 
and to permit the government to behave more like the private sector. It modeled the private sector practice of awarding to companies with strong performance records. FASO also stated that it was appropriate and relevant that a contracting official consider a contractor's past performance as an indicator of the offeror's ability to perform the contract successfully. It also stated that an offeror that has no information on past contract performance or no past contract performance information is available may not be evaluated favorably or unfavorably on the factor of past contract performance. FASA required the administrator of OFPP to establish policies and procedures that encourage the consideration of offerers past performance in the selection of contractors. OFPP issued a policy letter, which is known as 92-5, that established requirements for evaluating contractor performance and for using past performance information in the source selection process. The OFPP Act and FASA requirements and the OFPP policies are all contained in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, FAR Parts 9, 12, 13, 15, 36, and 42. Over the past five years, OFPP has issued additional policy guidance to strengthen agency use of past performance information and to improve agency reporting compliance and documentation. OFPP's July 29, 2009 memorandum, entitled Improving the Use of Contractor Performance Information, described new FAR requirements to strengthen the use of contractor performance information. It also included agency management responsibilities and established OFPP's review process for evaluating agencies' effective reporting of contractor performance information. Then in January 2011, OFPP also issued another, another memorandum entitled Improving Contractor Past Performance Assessments. It, it included the summary and strategies for improvement of past performance information. It also included OFPP's initial assessment of agencies reporting of contractor performance information and additional strategies for improving the collection of past performance information. We recently issued a memorandum in 2013 entitled Improving the Collection and Use of Information about Contractor Performance and Integrity Information, which requested agencies to, one, establish a baseline for reporting compliance, two, set aggressive performance targets that OFPP and agencies can use to monitor and measure reporting compliance, and three, it also required agencies to ensure the workforce is trained to properly report and use this information to improve the collection and use of performance and integrity information. Additional guidance is planned to enhance agencies' use of performance information, making certain that we conduct research and outreach without public and, public and private sector acquisition colleagues to as, obtain as much relevant and recent performance information about a contractor's performance history. With regards to regulatory changes in the area of performance, we have issued numerous changes over the past five years, starting with mandating the use of standard performance information reporting systems, known as the Past Performance Information Retrieval System. We also established procedures to ensure that contracting officers provide contractor information, such as terminations for cause or default, and effective cost of pricing data into the past performance information system and into the federal awarding performance and integrity system module within PEEPERS. We standardized the past performance evaluation factors and rating criteria used in the contract evaluation and CPARS. Future changes will include requiring that contractors are provided up to 14 calendar days from the date of delivery of past performance evaluations and to CPARS to submit comments, rebuttals, or additional information pertaining to past performance for the inclusion in the database. FAR subpart 4215 will also be updated to accommodate the consolidation of the A&E contract administration support systems and the construction contractor appraisal support system into the one CPARS database. In the area of integrity, several regulatory changes were made to establish the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, known as FAPAS, 
And that system includes government and contractor reported integrity information. This information is also publicly available on the website. As you can see on the screen, we have a list of all the different regulatory changes that have been made. And if you want to follow how these cases are progressing, you can go to our website, the OFPP website, for information about the different regulations. So what is past performance information? Past performance information is relevant information for source selection officials regarding a contractor's actions under previously awarded contracts and orders. It includes the performance ratings and narratives that support the rating assigned. The past performance evaluation report includes information about the contractor's record of conforming to requirements and to standards in the contract. It includes records of estimated and controlling costs. It also includes their ad adherence to contract schedules, including administrative aspects of performance. We also want to include in this report history of reasonable and cooperative behavior and commitment to customer satisfaction. A record of their integrity and business ethics is also included, as well as business-like concern for the interests of the customer. This information is a likely indicator of future performance. For certain requirements, the use of past performance as an evaluation factor can be highly effective in reducing the government's risk. So why is past performance information used? Past performance information is used to aid the government's decision process and to ensure that we award to contracts to companies that consistently produce and deliver quality products on time and within schedule. FAR Parts 9, 15, and 42 all discuss why past performance information is used during the pre-award process. For example, as in the contract qualification section, FAR Part 9 or Subpart 9.104-1, and there it says it is used as one factor in determining contractor responsibility. In FAR 15.304, during contracting by negotiations, it is used to validate statements made in the company's proposal. We look at the capability, experience, and risk, and it is an integral part to ensure that we get the best value during the source selection process, and it addresses past performance as an evaluation factor. Agencies also use PEEPERS, data that is within three years, six for construction and A&E contracts of the completion of the performance of the evaluated contract or order, and information contained in the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, system known as FAPAS. We look for them to report in their terminations for default or cause. It is also used during the post-award contract administration process. And in this part of the FAR, FAR 42.15, it addresses the collection of contractor performance during the period of the contract. So what are some of the benefits of using past performance information? The main purpose of past performance evaluation is to appropriately consider each offeror's demonstrated record of performance in supplying products and services that meet users' needs, including cost and schedule. Performance information is beneficial to source selection officials during the source selection process because it represents useful information about a contractor's past performance record and tells the story of the contractor's performance, both good and bad. It is a key indicator for predicting future performance in the performance quality, technical ability, and customer satisfaction. It gives insight into the contractor's actual ability to perform the work as opposed to relying strictly on proposal promises. It can be a powerful incentive for contractors to maximize performance and customer satisfaction on their current contracts. Performance information outside of PEEPERS provides a full view of a contractor's performance ability on contracts of similar size and scope from both commercial, state, local, and even foreign governments. So what are the benefits of using past performance information in the contract administration process? Past performance information is used during this process, and the benefits of it are 
It documents a contractor's performance annually to make sure contractors are performing the work and government contract deliverables are received. It promotes communication with your contractors. It motivates contractors to strive for performance, excellence, and customer satisfaction. It also recognizes good performance and reduces performance risk and supports contract oversight. Periodic performance evaluations during contract administration not only provides a way to track contractor performance, but also encourages excellence in performance. Past performance evaluation reports are equivalent to an annual performance appraisal or school report card if you have children. So when is past performance information reported? Past performance evaluations are required for contracts and orders for supplies, services, research and development, and contingency operation contracts, including contracts and orders performed inside and outside the United States, expected to exceed the simplified acquisition threshold, which is now 150,000, with some exceptions. For each construction contract, the reporting threshold is 650,000 or more. For each A&E contract, which is known as architect and engineering services contracts, the reporting threshold is 30,000 or more. Additionally, if the contract includes a small business subcontracting plan, past performance evaluation should include an assessment of contractor performance against an, performance against and efforts to achieve the goals identified in the small business subcontracting plan. Evaluations in past performance systems should be completed within a timely manner after the end of the contract or order evaluation period. Contracting and program officials should evaluate contractor performance during performance and when the contract is completed to ensure effective contract administration and to provide information required to support future award decisions. So who evaluates contractor performance? The principal goal of a past performance evaluation and rating system is to collect and present accurate and relevant contractor performance information to the official making a source selection decision. That is why it is important that the evaluation is done by individuals who have knowledge of the contractor's performance. Evaluation of a contractor's performance should be shared, a shared responsibility within the acquisition community with members from the program office, requirements office, and contracting office all documenting their knowledge of the contractor's performance. Agency procedures can identify many individuals responsible for evaluating the contractor's performance. Evaluation input can be obtained from many sources, such as the contracting officer or contract specialist, administrative contracting officer, the contracting officer representative, or the contracting officer technical representative, the program manager, or the equivalent individual responsible for the program project or task, job, and delivery order execution. Performance evaluators and quality assurance evaluators, auditors and users of the product or service, and any other technical or business advisor involved in the contract may be responsible for documenting performance. If agency procedures do not specify the individual responsible for past performance evaluation duties, duties the contracting officer is responsible for this function. So now I'll talk a little bit about how a contractor's performance is evaluated. Contractor's performance will be assessed and rated on the following technical evaluation factors. They will be rated on their technical ability, the quality of the product or service provided to the government. We'll also evaluate them on their cost control, which is generally not applicable to firm fixed price or fixed price with economic price adjustment arrangement contracts. We'll also look at this, their schedule and timeliness in terms of making sure that they comply with the government's timeframes. We'll also look at their management or business relations and rate them on how they deal with the customer agencies. We'll look at their small business subcontracting plan and look at how they work with their small businesses. And we'll also look at other applicable areas such as if they have late or non-payment to subcontractors, if they've committed any trafficking violations, and we'll also document and rate them on their tax delinquencies, whether or not they, whether or not they have tax, tax delinquencies. And there's many more information that they can be evaluated on as long as that information is mentioned to them in their contracts and their solicitations. Each factor and sub-factor is evaluated and rated in accordance with a five-scale 
adjectival rating system. We usually rate them in the, fo in the following categories. They would either receive exceptional, very good, satisfactory, marginal, and unsatisfactory. And a supportive narrative will be provided that documents and supports the rating assigned. So where is past performance information reported? Agencies report past performance information into the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, known as CPARS. CPARS is a suite of web-enabled applications that are used to document and collect performance information. Assessment ratings and clear and completed narrative supporting ratings are included in this documentation. The evaluation should include a clear, non-technical description of the principal purpose of the contract or order, reflect how the contractor performed, include clear, relevant information that accurately depicts the contractor's performance that is based on objective, objective facts supported by program and contract or order performance data, and tell it to the contract type, size, content, content, and complexity of the contractual requirements. Assessing officials should discuss contract and order performance with the contractor during the performance period and during the CPARS process. Assessing officials should document positive and negative performance, how problems are resolved, adjustments made to mitigate risk, and any other relevant information about the contractor's performance. So let's talk a little bit more about the CPARS evaluation process and the other companion system that goes along with CPARS, which is known as PEPERS. CPARS evaluations, including any contractor submitted information, are automatically transmitted to the past performance information retrieval systems, known as PEPERS, not later than 14 days after the date on which the contractor is notified of the evaluation's availability for comment. PEPERS is a central warehouse for performance assessment reports received from CPARS. Agencies are required to monitor their compliance with the past performance evaluation requirements and use the CPARS and PEPERS metrics tools to measure the quality and timely reporting of past performance information. So when we talk about access to past performance information, agencies should make sure that they have appropriate management and technical controls in place to ensure that only authorized personnel have access to the CPARS and PEPERS data. Contractors can only review their own evaluation reports and agencies should make sure that that access is only granted to the contractor being evaluated. As you are aware, agencies are reporting integrity information into another system known as FAPIS. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about the integrity information. Section 872 of the National Defense Authorization Act of fiscal year 2009 required the General Services Administration to develop and maintain a database containing specific performance and integrity information on potential awardees to support award decisions for actions over $500,000. The Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, known as FAPIS, was established as a module within PEPERS. Section 3010 of the Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2010 required that information in FAPIS, excluding past performance reviews, be made publicly available. FAPIS requires agencies and contractors to record negative performance integrity information. FAPIS includes contractor self-reported reported information regarding their criminals, convictions, civil liabilities, and adverse administrative actions where there was a finding of fault or damages of $5,000 or more, $100,000 for administrative agreements if the contract value is, is expected to exceed $500,000 and contractor or grantee has federal contracts and grants with total value greater than $10 million. The government is required to report information such as terminations for default, terminations for cause, non-responsibility determinations, defective pricing information, administrative agreements, terminations for material failure to comply, recipient not qualified determinations, and then DOD is required to report determinations of contract and default or fault. 
Agencies shall ensure information is accurately reported in the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System module of CPERS within three calendar days after a contracting officer makes a final decision. The next two slides include FAR Performance and Integrity Information Citations, starting with FAR Part 9.104 all the way down to FAR 52.209-9. These citations include information about how to use past performance information during the source selection process as well as during the contract administration process when you're evaluating the contractor's performance. For policy guidance, please visit the OFPP website and, see, and also see your agency specific guidance for more information about how to document past performance information as well as your agency's roles and procedures with regards to past performance. Please submit questions about OFPP past performance policies to me at my email address listed here, as well as submit your agency best practices and procedures to the OMB Max website listed here on the slide. Next, you will hear from Doreen Powell. Doreen is a Quality Assurance Specialist with the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting Systems, CPARS, Program Management Office at the Naval Sea Logistics Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. She will provide an overview of the past performance process and the best practices agencies can use for submitting a quality evaluation. Hello, my name is Doreen Powell and I'm from the CPARS Program Office at the Naval Sea Logistics Center. This session will cover the Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, or CPARS, and the Past Performance Information Retrieval System, or PEEPERS. During this session, we will see an overview of the past performance process, including the contributors to a past performance evaluation, the users of that evaluation, and the relationship between CPARs and PEEPERS. Next, we will review the areas of contractor performance that are evaluated as taken from the Federal Acquisition Regulation, or FAR, and the Federal Guidance for CPARs document. We will examine the elements which make up an evaluation with a particular focus on the most important parts of the evaluation, which are the narrative comments. Examples of best practices for writing a quality narrative for the evaluation will be provided during this session. We will also take a look at some upcoming improvements to CPARs and PEEPERS, and we'll conclude this session with an overview of the resources available on the CPARs and PEEPERS websites, as well as the point of contact information for the CPARs and PEEPERS help desk. CPARS is the automated information system used to record contractor past performance information. Government contracting and programming officials use CPARS to prepare an evaluation or report card documenting the contractor's performance on a given contract for a specific period of time. Contractor representatives also provide input to the evaluation in CPARS by entering comments to reflect whether they concur or do not concur with the government's assessment of their performance. The evaluation is transferred from CPARS to PEEPERS, where it is retrieved by government source selection officials to aid in making best value award decisions during source selections. The evaluation is also where I, you're ahead, sorry. The, <laughs> the evaluation is also available via PEEPERS to senior management at the contractor who is the subject of the evaluation. Six areas of contractor performance are rated and described on the evaluation. These areas are listed in both the FAR and the Federal Guidance for CPARS document. The first area that is evaluated is quality of the product or service provided by the contractor. For this area, the evaluator compares the quality of the good or service to the requirements in the contract in terms of performance parameters or quality objectives. Quantitative measures should be used to describe contractor performance wherever possible. For example, if the contractor is operating a software support help desk and is required to resolve customer calls within a one hour time frame, the evaluation should compare the one hour contract requirement to the contractor's actual resolution time. The quality evaluation should also address the contractor's management of the quality control program and the overall quality of the work or service. The second area of evaluation is schedule. In this area, the evaluator should compare the date of delivery for the good or service to the delivery date required in the contractor order. 
The assessment for this area should address both the timely completion of the contractor order and the com timely completion of the major performance milestones. For example, the evaluation should answer questions such as, was the overall final deliverable provided on time? What was the benefit to the government if delivery was made early, or what was the impact to the government if the deliverable was late? Were reports and data deliverables provided on time? In addition, the schedule evaluation area should address if administrative requirements, such as contract closeout documentation, were provided in a timely manner. The third evaluation area is cost control. In this area, the evaluator discusses the contractor's performance in terms of forecasting, managing, and controlling cost. Actual costs are compared with the budgeted costs per the contractor order to determine if they are consistent. Any cost overruns or underruns are addressed, along with their impact or benefit to the government. For example, if there was a cost overrun, the supporting narrative may address what areas of performance had to be de-scoped in, in order to cover the overrun. If there was a cost underrun, the narrative may address other areas within scope to which the funds could be applied in order to generate additional benefits to the government. Cost control is not evaluated on fixed price contracts or orders. The fourth area of contractor performance that is evaluated is management. In the management area, the contractor's integration and coordination of all activity necessary to ensure that the contract performance meets requirements is evaluated. The contractor's ability to proactively identify performance problems and then to develop successful corrective action plans is assessed. The contractor is also rated on whether they have displayed reasonable and cooperative behavior and a business-like concern for the customer, as well as overall customer satisfaction. When evaluating the management area, it is important for the performance evaluator to consider input from the many stakeholders who are impacted by the contractor's management, including the program office, contracting officer's representative, contracting officer, and product or service end users. The contractor's ability to successfully coordinate the activities of subcontractors is also addressed in this area, if applicable. In addition, the management evaluation area includes an assessment of the contractor's program management efforts and their management of key personnel, if the contract contains a key personnel clause. The fifth evaluation area is utilization of small business. In this area, the contractor's compliance with the terms and conditions for small business participation in contract performance is evaluated. The contractor's achievement of their small business subcontracting goals is addressed, including their initiatives to assist, promote, and utilize small business, small disadvantaged business, women-owned small business, hub-zoned small business, veteran-owned small business, and service-disabled veteran-owned small business. The supporting narrative for this evaluation area should address the percentage of the goals that were achieved by the contractor, as well as their good faith efforts to provide meaningful and innovative work directly related to the contract to small businesses. The sixth area of evaluation is regulatory compliance. Here, the evaluator assesses the contractor's compliance with all terms and conditions in the contractor order relating to applicable regulations and codes. Regulations and codes may be of a financial, environmental, labor, or safety nature, and may also include reporting requirements. For example, the evaluator should consider the contractor's compliance with regulations and codes such as labor laws, safety requirements, cost accounting standards, hazardous materials requirements, requirements to use environmentally preferable and energy efficient products, equal employment opportunity, and prohibitions on trafficking in persons. Next, we will answer the question, what does an evaluation consist of? By examining the parts of a CPARS report card. The first part of an evaluation is the administrative information. Administrative information includes the contractor identification information, such as the contractor's name, address, and DUNS number. Other administrative information that is collected for each evaluation includes contract dollar value, significant contract dates, such as award date and completion date, and a list of subcontractors, their DUNS, and a description of the work they are performing. Next, the evaluation includes a contract effort description. This description is taken from the contract statement of work or statement of objectives, and details the nature of work being performed under the contract. The contract effort description is extremely important to source selection officials because it enables them to determine if the type of contract 
if the type of effort performed under the contract is similar in scope and therefore relevant to their source selection. The next part of the evaluation is the ratings. A rating is assigned to each evaluation area using a five-level scale consisting of the adjectives exceptional, very good, satisfactory, marginal, and unsatisfactory. There are definitions for each of these adjectives in the FAR and in the Federal Guidance for CPARS document. It is critical that the evaluator use these definitions when assigning ratings. Following the ratings is the assessing official or evaluator narrative. This part of the evaluation is required for each area which is rated and provides the detail necessary to support the ratings assigned. The evaluator should be extremely thorough when preparing the narrative so as to provide source selection officials with sufficient information to make an informed best value award decision. The evaluation also includes narrative comments from the contractor being evaluated. The contractor has the option to provide a written response to the government's evaluation and to indicate if they concur or do not concur with the ratings and narratives which describe their performance. The final piece of the evaluation is the reviewing official comments. The reviewing official is the government official who is a level above the evaluator and whose function is to resolve disputes between the government and the contractor regarding the evaluation. Reviewing official comments are only required when the contractor indicates that they do not concur with the government's evaluation of their performance. The assessing official narratives are the most important part of the evaluation because they provide source selection officials with the details required to make a best value award decision. Let's review some best practices for submitting a quality evaluation. First, the ratings and narratives should be consistent with the rating definitions in the FAR and in the Federal Guidance for CPARS document. The definitions provide criteria for the contractor's performance in terms of meeting contractual requirements and providing corrective actions for problems encountered during contract performance. It is extremely important that the evaluation ratings and narratives be consistent with these definitions so that source selection officials can be assured that all evaluators are using the same grading scale when reviewing numerous evaluations. Next, it is critical that the ratings assigned be supported by objective evidence and that that objective evidence be described in the assessing official narrative. For example, the evaluator should consider evidence contained in status, progress, production and management reviews, earned value management data, cost and schedule metrics, technical reviews, quality assurance evaluations, earned contract incentives and award fee determinations, subcontract reports, and records of safety and labor standard compliance. The use of objective evidence provides source selection officials with a greater degree of confidence that the evaluator has prepared a thorough and fair performance evaluation. Another best practice is to address the benefit or impact of the contractor's performance to the government. For example, if the contractor exceeded contract requirements in terms of quality, the narrative should describe how the higher quality good or service provided better enabled the agency to meet its mission or increase customer satisfaction. Conversely, if the contractor did not meet the quality requirements of the contract, the narrative should describe the negative impact to the agency's ability to perform its mission. A well-written evaluation should detail the contractor's strengths and weaknesses and should also take into account any government role in the contractor's inability to meet contract requirements. For instance, if the government was late in providing government furnished information that was critical for the contractor to successfully perform, and then the contractor was subsequently late in delivering, the government should take that fact into account when rating the contractor in the schedule area and should describe those circumstances in the supporting narrative. In addition, a quality narrative should contain objective statements and be devoid of personal statements and conjecture. <coughs> Excuse me. Next, let's look at some upcoming improvements for CPARS. Currently, CPARS contains separate modules for the evaluation of architect, engineer, and construction contracts. These modules, the Architect Engineer Contract Administration Support System, or ACAS, and the Construction Contractor Appraisal Support System, or CCAS, will be consolidated into the overall CPARS software application. The consolidation will result in the use of a single evaluation form and single workflow for all contractor past performance evaluations, no matter the business sector. The consolidated or merged software will be deployed on July 1st, 2014.
Peepers will also be undergoing some upcoming improvements. First, an improved metrics display will be added to provide better search and display capabilities for more efficient access to relevant reports. In addition, Peepers will be enhanced to include an ad hoc reporting feature to provide the ability for source selection officials to tailor reports to best meet their needs. Both of these improvements will be available in December 2014. There are many resources available online to assist you in using CPARS and Peepers. First, let's look at some of the resources available on the CPARS website at https colon slash slash www.cpars.gov. The website contains a training link where you will find access to instructor-led online training, automated training, and on-site training when available. Classes are free, and anyone who is new to CPARS or is looking for a refresher is encouraged to sign up for a class. Next, the CPARS website contains a guidance link where you can find the federal CPARS guidance document, the CPARS user manual, and several Office of Procurement Policy, or OF and several Office of Federal Procurement Policy, or OFPP, memos. The guidance link is a great place to look if you have questions about the CPARS reporting requirements, user roles, workflow, or software. This screenshot of the CPARS homepage highlights both the guidance and the training links. Next, let's take a look at some of the resources on the PEEPERS website at https colon slash slash www.peepers.gov. First, there's the training link where you can sign up to take online instructor-led training. Whether you are new to using Peepers or are simply looking for a refresher, taking a training class is an excellent way to get started. The Peepers reference links contains both the Peepers user manual, which describes how to operate the software, and a link to information regarding the Peepers compliance reports and metrics. Lastly, the guidance link provides an OFPP memo regarding improving the collection and use of contractor performance and integrity information. This screenshot of the PEEPERS homepage highlights the guidance, reference, and training links. We will now conclude with point of contact information for the CPARS and PEEPERS Help Desk. The Help Desk is available by phone at 207-438 1690 or for Department of Defense employees at DSN 684-1690. The help desk can also be reached via email at webptsmh at navy.mil. Help desk support is available from Monday through Friday from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The help desk provides excellent support for all types of questions and is a ready resource to assist you in navigating the contractor performance evaluation process. You will now hear from agency acquisition leaders that have made some great achievements in this area, such as the establishment of sound contract management policies and procedures that establish clear roles and responsibilities for their acquisition workforce in this process. You will also hear them talk about their enhanced management oversight, improved past performance reporting compliance strategies. Aggressive training tactics also were established to ensure their workforce is trained in this area. And you will also hear them talk about many more practices that they have used to improve their reporting compliance and as well as the quality of the information in the system. We are very appreciative of them taking time to share their best practices that they are using to emphasize the importance of this function to their acquisition community and to improve reporting compliance, both in the timeliness and the quality of the information reported. Hello, I'm Dick Jenman, Director, Defense Procurement and Acquisition Policy. I've been asked to speak about how the Department of Defense has approached accountability for past performance. Several years ago, I testified before the Commission on Wartime Contracting. One of the issues they addressed was past performance. It wasn't a pretty picture. At the time, DOD's collection of data was below 50%. Over the past several years, we've moved our performance to over 83%, and we plan to be above 90% this year. So how have I done it? Or how have we done it? Um, I'll touch on three areas, roles and responsibilities, collection and usage. We have emphasized the importance of past performance through training 
improving our documentation and tools so that individuals understand their roles and responsibilities related to past performance information. So first, training. The Defense Acquisition University, or DAU, has developed six courses aimed at addressing past performance. One, a continuous learning course, or CLC for short, focuses expressly on past performance information and is targeted at contracting officers. Another is directed at contracting officer representatives, or CORs, with a mission focus and may be used to meet COR certification requirements. We also have two in-residence courses for CORs. One covers the broad responsibilities of a COR and the other is focused on COR responsibilities in a contingency or warfighting environment. We have a more advanced contingency COR course for those with broader, more complex responsibilities. Finally, we also have a course on source selection and administration of service contracts that focuses, among other things, on the use of past performance information in source selections and its collection and service contracts. In addition to the DAU courses, we use workshops, seminars, and conferences as opportunities to do training on the importance of past performance from both a collection and use perspective. From a policy perspective, we've reworked what we call Procedures, Guidance, and Information, or PGI for short. PGI is a part of the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, or DFARS. In it, we discuss responsibility determinations prior to award and the use of FAPIS, the Federal Awardee Performance and Integrity Information System, and SAM, the System for Award Management, to gather information to use in these determinations. We also wrote a DOD COR handbook that fits in the pocket of the camouflage uniform and have updated it several times, most recently in 2012. In it, we stress the COR's responsibility for ensuring services and supplies conform to quality and performance requirements of the contract. That the contract quality surveillance is an essential COR activity, that CORs are responsible for input to CPARs, and that CORs must continually monitor performance. We also developed a tool that contracting officers can use to keep track of CORs and have mandated its use throughout the department. The COR tracking tool, or CORT, is web-based and tracks the appointment and management of CORs. It keeps track of training and required monthly status reports. The contracting officer can easily determine whether or not reports are being done on a timely basis. Training, documentation, and tools, though, are not enough. Program managers, CORs, and contracting officers must report past performance information. OFPP has issued two memorandum, one in July 2009 and the other in January 2011, that focus on improving the collection of past performance information. The Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics issued a memorandum in November 2011 that made clear CPAR's reporting is a shared responsibility of program managers, requirements offices, and contracting personnel. To footstop, past performance reporting only works when it is viewed as a priority by the leadership, not only for timeliness of the input, but also the quality of the report. With the issuance of this memorandum, my office began reporting quarterly to senior leadership how each service and agency within the department was doing reporting past performance information. With the increased visibility at the most senior levels of the department, our timeliness of reports has increased each quarter for the past three years. In addition to the quarterly reporting, past performance is discussed as an agenda item at the Business Senior Integration Group, or BSIG, meetings, chaired by the Undersecretary Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Beyond CPAR's data reporting, the department also collects through automated systems quality and timeliness statistics on the large number of spare part procurements and centrally stores the data so all services and agencies can use it. Collecting past performance data is only valuable if it is used. Past performance is a mandatory element in any source selection evaluation unless specifically weighed by the contracting officer. CPAR's data is retrieved by contracting officers for use in source selection evaluations. Additionally, PEEPERS-SR, 
the Past Performance Information Retrieval System statistical reporting is available for use between the higher thresholds established by DOD for past performance collection and the need for past performance data for lower dollar item procurements. PEEPERS SR generates past performance ratings based on objective data about delivery and quality on current and recent contracts. It grades each supplier's performance by federal supply group and federal supply code. Contractors are assigned a color rating that depicts quality of past performance and a numeric indicator representing their on-time delivery performance. The Defense Logistics Agency uses this data in an automated contract award system that does over 3,000 transactions daily and helps ensure we only contract with responsible contractors. We also use quality performance data collected through GUIDEP, the Government and Industry Data Exchange Program, and PDQRS, the Product Quality Deficiency Report System, to help the department identify and resolve supply chain quality issues. As we look to the future, we plan to add information on counterfeit material receipts, customs reporting on import problems, and data from other systems that identify waste, fraud, or abuse by contractors. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about past performance information with you today. Hello, my name is Bill McNally, uh, AA for procurement for NASA, and I want to cover two important areas on past performance. Um, what I'm going to talk about is first the collection of past performance, how we do that at NASA and how we uh, populate the CPAR systems. And then secondly, I'm going to talk about in more depth how we use past performance, how we use that information in the data system in our source selections. And then I'll, I'll wrap up with a few uh, policy updates on what's being looked at in the FAR as it relates to past performance. So our, our past performance uh, policy is to uh, collect information through the uh, CPAR systems, which we have gone through a transition. We used to have our own system at NASA, the uh, PEEPER system, and uh, so we have adjusted to start utilizing a, uh, uh, not a DOD, but a federal-wide system on past performance. And the key thing there is to make sure that when contracts are over, that we uh, collect the information from our contracting officer and contracting officer reps, everybody involved in the acquisition, to give us the information regarding the performance of that contractor. So many of our contracts are more than one year. So what we do is at, at each year uh, period, we collect past perf performance information of that contractor. So it's really critical that we go out there and do timely and accurate past performance information. Of course, we let the contractor see our assessment, give us a chance to give an update. And one of the things I'll be talking about later is a policy update to shorten that time period between our assessment and the feedback we get from industry. So what I really want to do, though, is spend time, what I call is probably the most critical part of past performance. You know, why do we collect past performance information? Well, we want to use it to gauge the confidence of the contractors that we're doing source selections. So in NASA, most of our source selections, there's three factors that we use. One is mission suitability, where we uh, look at the technical approach, the management approach of the contractor, how they're going to do the job that we have in our solicitation. The second part, which is price. And in some cases, we look at for reasonableness, or we do a realistic uh, look at price when we're not doing firm fixed price contracts. And the last piece, we're looking at past performance. And there, we're looking at what is our confidence rating of the vendor. So again, mission suitability, how they're going to do the work, price, what they're going to charge us. And third, what is our confidence that they're actually going to do the work that we're going to select them on. So in the past performance assessment, uh, we utilize a uh, SEB, Source Selection Evaluation Board. And what we have made up there are voting members, and we have folks who are involved in 
uh, particular areas, functional areas. So we'll have a group that actually uh, works on the source selection just on the past performance. And there, they're looking at what they get from the contractor as far as what's submitted, but they also go look at what's in the database, the CPARS database. And one of the key aspects is to make sure we're looking at the relevancy of the source selection information. And so what does relevancy really mean? What relevancy really means is that if I have a requirement for system engineering support, then I want to look at the contractors, have they done system engineering support on other contracts? So that's a relevancy in the type of work. Then I want to say if my requirement is $100 million a year, I want to see a contractor's past performance in that dollar range. And the other things I might look at is if I have a subcontracting plan for small business. I'll look at how well the contractor performed in meeting small business subcontracting goals. So we look at the requirement that we're putting out in the solicitation, and then we're looking at to match up the relevancy in our past performance assessments. So when we finish doing that, then we're going to go and look at the actual performance. And there, we put the two together to come up with these areas that I listed here that are our scores. Uh, again, if a contractor is very high level of confidence, which is our highest score, that means they had relevant, very relevant past performance information on the work that matches my solicitation and that their performance was excellent in CPARs. So you have to have both matches to get that kind of score. And of course, it goes all the way down to very low level of confidence. The contractor may not have relevant work, but in most cases, their performance on those contracts were not very good. So we rated them as very, very low level of confidence. We do have a neutral rating, which isn't used a lot. And that's where the contractor has no past performance information. And so we don't want to rate them you know, negatively or positively. We put them down as neutral. So, so what we have is the SEB voting members and who are assisted by other members who go look at a lot of data. We look at the data that's submitted by the offers, uh, the, their prime contracts, but also the major subcontracts that are being proposed. So we look at the past performance, not only of the uh, offer who's a prime, but all the major subcontractors as well. We, we take a look at uh, the data, but then we also look at the database in the CPARs, because it's really important to under, understand. An offer is going to give you, of course, their best performing contracts. When they submit, here's the contracts we want you to look at that's relevant. And we will look at that. But we need to do our own check in the database. So going back to the beginning, that's why it's important that you uh, populate with your contracts the past performance information because that will help NASA and other agencies in their source selections. So, um, so I covered the uh, collection. I've covered the use in source selections. So here's a little some policy uh, updates that are, that are coming very shortly. One is we're, we're changing the FAR to change from the 30-day time frame where a vendor can come back for comments and rebuttals on their past performance to 14 days. We want to shorten that process down. Uh, again, we want to populate the database as quickly as possible. So that's the other thing we have in this is within the 14 days, the uh, CPAR assessment will be in the uh, CPAR database. The second update is, again, to uh, enhance our past performance information. Uh, so we're going to put in the uh, architect engineering contract administration support system information and the construction contract appraisal support system. Again, integrating past performance into information into one system. So again, what I like to do is thank you all who are watching this. Uh, thank you for your support in, in federal acquisition, the support you provide the mission 
uh, needs of your agency. And again, I, I applaud you and, and I want to thank you. Thank you, Bill, for joining us and discussing what NASA is doing to improve reporting compliance and how they're effectively using the past performance information in the source selection process. Now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions about past performance reporting compliance in terms of what you guys are doing to improve your uh, reporting goals. NASA has improved its reporting compliance and is now at 75% reporting compliance. Can you share with us your performance metrics that you are tracking within your agency and talk briefly about how you communicate progress of this acquisition function to your acquisition managers and staff within your agency? Yes, Julie. Uh, first of all, one of the things we do, we go out to each buying center and we do a review of their management system, the procurement management systems. So one of the things we look at is their past performance. Do they uh, do it in a timely manner? Do they actually write something that is legible, understandable? So we're looking at compliance as far as doing, but we're look also looking at the quality. So after that review, and that's one of the areas, so a lot of my centers are still not doing it timely. I mean, 75% is okay, but it's not good enough. And so I then discuss it with the center director, not the head of the buying activity, but the head of the contracting activity. So the center director at NASA is the top official at that center. And I, and I explain to them as far as uh, where they need to improve in the area of past performance and some other areas. And then I give them six months for corrective action. So last week I had all the procurement officers for a leadership meeting, and one of the areas we were talking about was past performance. We're probably going to be putting out a memo for the uh, NASA administrators to sign out, again, to cover the importance of past performance, but to get our numbers up even higher. Right. That's great to hear, Bill. And you also mentioned that you want to improve your reporting compliance, not just in the area of timeliness, but also in the area of quality. I heard you stress that throughout your presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about what you're doing to improve the quality of the information in the reports since those reports, since the information in the reports are, is really helpful and can be really useful to the source selection team as they evaluate past performance? Right. So, so again, once, what we do when we do our procurement management reviews, uh, we, we look at how well they write. But the other thing we're really focusing on is also in the RFPs. So, so for instance, if I'm asking for a uh, transportation system to carry astronauts to the International Space Station, there aren't a lot of companies who have that relevant experience. So I don't break it down that specific, but I'll take a look and look at the past performance of vendors that build a major system. So that way I'm not trying to get too unique because, again, I, I don't want to be uh, get someone who's neutral. I want to be able to look at someone that has either favorable or non-favorable past performance in an area that's very much similar to what I'm buying. But we, again, we go in, uh, we look at the quality of, the, um, of it. The centers have to do a self-assessment, self and one of the areas they have to do a self-assessment is what are they doing to improve their past performance information? That's good to hear, Bill. As with all the agencies presenting today and in this seminar, they all have taken a top-down management approach to improving reporting compliance and the quality of the information in the system. So it was really great to hear the information and the best practices that NASA is implementing within its agency to improve its quality and timely reporting of past performance information. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to more information from you in this area. You're welcome. Thank you. Hello, I'm Laurel Letta, the Executive Director for Procurement Policy and Oversight in the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer at the Department of Homeland Security. I'd like to thank the Office of Federal Procurement Policy and the Federal Acquisition Institute for giving us all the opportunity to share what we're doing to improve the collection and quality of past performance information. I'm looking forward to hearing how others have approached the challenge and hope to adopt tools and practices to take back to DHS. I remember being a contracting officer looking for past performance information to inform a selection decision. It was always disappointing not to find recent or relevant evaluations, 
but even more disappointing when the evaluations I found were too vague, sometimes a single sentence, to be useful for their intended purpose. When OFPP issued the agency's goals in March of 2013, we took a three-pronged approach to improving our performance on this metric. We took a top-down approach starting with a leadership commitment and then accountability through internal controls. And then we focused on getting the communication, policy, training, and tools out to the acquisition workforce to help them meet this challenge. About a month after OFPP's memo issuing the goals, one of our four undersecretaries at DHS, the Undersecretary for Management, issued a memorandum to the component acquisition executives who are the most closely associated with the programs and to the heads of contracting activity. In this memo, he identified discrete requirements to reinvigorate the collection and quality of past performance information, including requiring that the Office of the Chief Procurement Officer brief the Heads of Contracting Activity Council, the Component Acquisition Executive Council, and the Component Acquisition Executive Staff Forum on evaluation of contractor performance requirements. Each DHS component was to host a day of emphasis during which operational organizations would focus with support from headquarters, including face-to-face -face training, on registering and completing performance evaluations as a team. The chief procurement officer was to ensure that annual goal letters were issued to the HCAs to include the targets for past performance evaluations and that they would be included in performance plans for all contracting personnel. HCAs had to consider whether a required evaluation had been completed before they would process uh, an exercise, an option, or process follow-on requirements. Next, the Chief Procurement Officer included the collection and quality of performance evaluations as a key initiative in a strategic plan, establishing a performance metric and goals to be monitored, along with other key metrics focused on achieving quality contracting. By incorporating the collection and quality of performance evaluations into our strategic plan, we ensured accountability through internal controls. These include issuing the goal letter to each component, letting them know the goals to which they will be held accountable, ensuring that progress towards performance evaluations would be monitored quarterly, incorporating the collection of performance evaluations into the formal procurement health assessment which is conducted by the Chief Procurement Officer with each HCA biannually, and reporting the outcomes of the procurement health assessment to the individuals responsible for the performance appraisal for the HCA. We also issued an annual progress report in which we uh, basically take accountability for all of the performance metrics and our, and our procurement health assessment. This is done every year. And finally, we did oversight reviews, sending reminders and emphasizing the importance of the goals. The third prong to our approach began with communications. We used different communication me mechanisms, just as you do. For instance, those that are directed to the heads of contracting activity and those directed to their acquisition policy representatives. However, I think it's important to communicate directly with the acquisition workforce as well, rather than relying on already busy components to get the message out. As a result, we use things like Did You Know Communications, a more informal tool that goes directly to our 1102 community to make sure the message is getting to those who need it most. We also think it's important that we stop to recognize improvement along the way. And you can do this through recognizing the most improved organization or the highest quality organization. Uh, and of course, we also take that opportunity to identify areas for improvement. As for training, in fiscal year 2013, we provided face-to-face -face training for over 4,000 employees at DHS, representing not just 1102s, but others in the acquisition workforce who must support contra contractor performance evaluations. We hosted and supported days of emphasis where teams would receive training, ensure all backlog contracts were registered, and then complete the assessment. 
a day completely dedicated to completing contractor performance evaluations. We also provided tools such as quality checklists that included good sample narratives to help our acquisition workforce ensure their contractor performance evaluations would be useful. And finally, we supported all those acquisition workforce members in their efforts through both policy and system support. And of course, we issued policy for both our 1102s and our non-1102s, including the Contracting Officer Representative Guide, which provides information to the Corps on how they support the contractor performance evaluations. Of course, we have more work to do to ensure that our contractor performance evaluations are as helpful as possible to source selection teams, to ensure that the United States contracts with the best contractors with the highest levels of integrity and business ethics. Thank you, and I look forward to working with you on improving the collection and quality of contractor performance evaluations. Hello, everybody. I'm John Bashist. I'm the uh, Director of the Office of Acquisition Management at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, I'm here to talk about EPA's best practices in improving our contract performance assessment uh, reviews, our compliance uh, with both the reporting and the quality of our uh, contractor performance reviews. I've been in this profession almost 30 years. I began uh, at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration as a contract specialist and a contracting officer. And so I have a great uh, deal of empathy for all of the functions that the uh, contracting officer has to perform. As a matter of fact, I went to the FAR and identified 82 contract administration functions that the contracting officer has to perform. Uh, but why is it important uh, that we effectively report on contractor performance? Uh, well, one is we want to make sure that the taxpayers' dollars are uh, being spent uh, on contractors, both current and future contractors, uh, who are high performing and who are providing quality goods and services to the, to the federal government. And we also want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the opportunity to give our contractors feedback on their performance so that they can improve and become better contractors in the future. Um, as you can see from this slide, uh, we've better than doubled our compliance rate since uh, October of 2012, and I'll get into some of the management uh, initiatives that uh, we've undertaken to do that. Um, but, you know, meeting this, and I'm sure every, everybody watching this video has, is encountering challenges along the way, and in my experience, and I'm sure in many of yours, I would ca categorize our challenges really in two primary areas. One is a lack of management focus on compliance and accountability. And the other is um, the need to uh, write better performance-based contracts so that we have better performance measures against which we are uh, credibly and responsibly assessing our contractors. So what are some of the EPA management strategies that we're employing to achieve the improvements that we've achieved? Um, I think one of the most important things we can do is create awareness, uh, not just with the acquisition workforce and the people that support that, and by that I mean the contracting officers, the CORs, program managers, but I'm talking about the senior managers within the agency, uh, the people to whom those people report. Um, we need to make sure that they understand and appreciate the roles and responsibilities of the people to whom we're delegating those authorities to and what the consequences are for people not complying with those requirements. Uh, the other thing that we've done is we're actually dedicating staff to this. We've designated a lead and a backup in my organization and our policy organization, and we've identified a focal point at each of our 14 operational contracting offices within EPA. And lastly, uh, and, and probably most importantly, uh, what we've done is we've created a robust policy uh, and guidance framework as well as uh, integrated compliance and oversight with our performance management system. And I'll talk more about that in these other, other slides. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about the strategies uh, that we're employing. I mentioned that we've established a lead and a backup focal point for the agency to monitor the agency's compliance. And we've established a focal point in each of our 14 contracting activities within EPA. Uh, that group meets on a quarterly basis at a minimum, and it's an opportunity for those individuals to talk about the challenges that they're facing within their organizations and with their program customers. 
Uh, it's an opportunity for them to talk about best practices on how their managers are implementing uh, the, the, the requirements to comply, which include things like stand down days. Um, it's also an opportunity, and most recently we've uh, brought in NAVC uh, to give our folks briefing and a train the trainers concept on uh, the training that's available online for writing quality narratives for, for past performance. It was an opportunity to provide personalized training for our folks to ask questions uh, and get some answers to those questions. And uh, those individuals will now go out and provide personalized training uh, to the uh, acquisition community at EPA. Uh, NAFC also recently came in and, and uh, gave our folks a briefing on uh, the changes that are forthcoming, I believe, this month uh, in integrating CPARs with the separate past performance systems that are maintained for A&E and construction contracting. Uh, and uh, it's also an opportunity for uh, the, uh, uh, you know, I, I refer to this focal point group and, and to my lead as kind of the CPARs help desk. Um, NAVC, I'm sure, gets inundated from every agency on every question. This is an opportunity where uh, these focal points can filter those questions and we can bring an EPA consolidated uh, question to NAVC. It also gives us some visibility into some of the common issues that we might be encountering across the agency. Um, this group also does monthly compliance monitoring and the reporting from that not only uh, is to the focal points, but it's also to the managers at each of our contracting activities, and the report also comes to me so I can see how each organization is, is doing with respect to their compliance. Um, my, my staff also conducts one-on-one -on -one engagements, so if there's a, uh, an organization that's struggling with compliance, uh, they'll reach out and engage those folks directly and actually be able to share best practices or provide technical assistance or raise issues to my attention where I might have to take some action uh, with some senior managers in an organization uh, or, or a region. Um, and again, uh, we're building all of this around our performance management system and that's really intended to build knowledge management and I'll talk to that a little more as we, we go along. Um, so, uh, we are required to ensure that not only are we complying with the requirements that the contracts require, that are required to report past performance, but we also need to make sure that we're actually doing quality. We don't want to just, you know, check the block on compliance and have information and data in the system that is not useful to anyone. So back uh, last September, we conducted our first uh, a quality assessment. We took a random sample of 30% of all the um, uh, past performance reports that were in our system and did a quality review against criteria that we've established and uh, determined that we were actually doing a pretty good job. 78% uh, of, of uh, those uh, uh, reports actually contain very uh, high quality and useful information. Uh, and again, our goal is always 100% on those, so we're striving to get there uh, this year. Um, as I mentioned, uh, our agency lead performs annual quality review, and again, what we do is at a minimum we're going to look at 25% random sample, but I mentioned that we've also integrated this within our organization's uh, performance management program. Part of that pr program uh, encompasses a contract management assessment program, and uh, most of you folks that have been in this profession for quite a while uh, think about this as part of self-assessment or procurement management reviews. Uh, we have both. So we have specific criteria against which organizations are required on an annual basis to assess themselves uh, in terms of uh, pre-award, post-award contract management systems, and we have specific criteria built around uh, contractor past performance reporting and doing an, an internal assessment of the quality of those reports. And then once every three years, we have a peer review team, we have a core team, and then uh, a group of uh, experienced contracts folks that supplement that team that review each contracting activity on uh, once every three years at a minimum um, on those same criteria. So we've integrated in both, so not only do we do an annual, but we also do a, uh, you know, a continuous ongoing assessment uh, as part of a larger uh, contract management uh, program. Uh, and I will tell you, we've recently uh, conducted a review of one of our regions and uh, they're at 80% compliance and uh, uh, close to 100% uh, on quality on their reviews. So I think we're really turning the, the corner and, and making some significant progress. And again, uh, my superstar who's managing this whole program is Stacy Ramraka. Her information's right there and I encourage you to give her a call if you have any questions or if we can provide any assistance to you. Thanks.
Hi, I'm Iris Cooper. I'm the uh, Senior Procurement Executive for the Department of the Treasury. Um, like my colleague John, I am a contracting professional by trade. I have spent over 25 years being a contracting officer and kind of working my way up. So I feel your pain. Um, when it comes to talking about past performance, I think for most contracting professionals, that is about as exciting as talking about contract closeout. It's one of the things we have to do, and it's critical that we do it right. Um, so just complying to get the numbers isn't good enough. It's driving the whole quality aspect of past performance reporting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about contractor past performance information, why we should do it, and why it matters to us. Uh, what are the challenges to getting to compliance, especially to the quality piece? Um, strategic management and how we're dealing with it at the Department of the Treasury. And then the quality of the past performance information, some of the steps we have taken in Treasury to implement that piece. So obviously federal acquisition regulation compels us to uh, you know, monitor contractor past performance. We must monitor performance evaluation requirements. I think sometimes if we would write better requirements documents, probably we would end up with better past performance documentation. But, you know, it all is interconnected. We need to focus on that end as well. Agencies are required to use the uh, Contractor Performance Assessment Reporting System, CPARS, and Past Performance Information Retrieval System, PEEPERS, to measure the quality and timely reporting of past performance information. It is required for each contract or order or above the simplified acquisition threshold, with some exceptions. Um, so why does it matter? I think past performance is a good indicator of future performance. Uh, reliable past performance information supports source selections. I have used it successfully in major source selections, and it is absolutely critical for us to consider that when we do competitive awards. Um, even in a single source award, but it's critical information to have. The better the quality, the more useful during a source selection. In the current budget environment, I think it's essential that we award to absolutely the best contractors available that deliver on time and of high quality. And really, when you think about it, those of us who use Angie's List, you're not going to go get the services of a plumber who isn't good. I mean, you're going to check the rating. You're going to make sure you get the best out of it. This is no different. The government deserves the same, and we have that responsibility. So the challenge in, uh, to achieving not only the compliance ratings but also the quality piece is acquisition is a team sport. A uh, contracting officer is largely held responsible unless the agency has implemented different regulations, but it's a shared responsibility by the COR, the program manager, and the contracting officer. It is a team sport. We need to play together, together to get it right. The quality piece is often lacking because, um, and people are overworked. People don't. This is not the most and um, the high priority item on their desk. So if you give it a satisfactory rating, you're done. You don't have to justify a whole lot, and you know it gets you the compliance. It doesn't get you the quality piece. And I think there's also sometimes a sentiment of let's avoid the confrontation with the contractor if we have negative past performance because it causes extra work and you go into this, to this do loop of back and forth until you resolve the issue. It is absolutely critical you take on that responsibility. I think as 1102s, especially as contracting officers, it is a responsibility and that is our value proposition in this process as well. Um, without quality in the past performance rating, we actually allow poorly performing contractors to continue to exist in the federal space. And we need to clearly resolve this. I actually encourage our contracting officers outside just the regular reporting cycle, pick up the phone and call the company, especially if you deal with some of these smaller companies who are new to government, and say, how is it going from their perspective, not just from our perspective. Um, I think if you have that kind of feedback mechanism, most contractors want to do a fabulous job. They want that good rating. It's a great way of opening the dialogue this way. If something goes wrong, don't wait for the, for the feedback, the formal feedback piece. Engage and try to resolve because that works best for everybody. Um, when you think about it, we take time to you know, rate a restaurant on Yelp. You can certainly rate a contractor in CPARS. It's, it's really not a whole lot different. 
So past performance compliance. Um, one thing we've done at Treasury is um, we actually looked at our internal policy and said, how can we improve what we're doing and put a better structure in place? So we didn't only focus on just the completion of the past performance information, but also looked at how do we drive the quality component of what we're doing. Um, the strategic management, I think it's critical. If senior management pays attention, everybody pays attention. I know I pay attention to what my boss wants, and I'm sure it's the same for most of us. So uh, senior leadership accountability. We're organized into bureaus, and the bureau chiefs responsible for contracting actually have this as part of their performance rating, and it is something we address on a monthly basis in our Treasury Acquisition Council meetings. Uh, we send out weekly the goals as we're inching upward. We're getting closer to the 80%, which is great. Um, I have a staff member on my staff that does the reporting, that sends it out, and then I add the encouragement, and you can see where, you know, the bureaus that are making rapid progress and putting attention to it. Um, we um, do report this up to our senior leadership. It is part of something the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury sees as part of our, our um, performance reviews. Um, and I think it's important. It's one of the measurements that is paid attention to at the highest levels. So I think we're getting there. So in terms of compliance, we've absolutely made progress. Um, I can't claim success because I've only been there for five months, but I think what we have done in the five months has been significant, and the department's done a great job driving this. Um, we have looked at how do we best improve the quality component, and we're definitely not um, there yet. EPA definitely has um, some advantages. You guys are ahead of the game, so I can learn something here. We are pulling a sampling each month of the past performance entries, and we develop kind of a scoring system, and we look at this and we report out at the TAC so they know we're, how we're doing. I would say we definitely have room for improvement um, because it's much easier to put a fully SAP and not worry about it, um, and we're kind of driving the more honest reporting. If the contractor was really good, they deserve the extra credit, and if there were deficiencies, then we must justify that as well. We provide training to the bureaus at request or, you know, on a regular basis, it, and it's one of the things that's mandated that they take. Um, so the whole evaluation and monitoring concept, when we do on-site assessments, we also pay attention to the past performance information and, and the recording of it. Um, I think we are encouraging them to put focus on it early in the year so it doesn't get overcome by events, which is always a problem in, in our area. And um, I think we are seeing the improvements we want, maybe not as quickly as we want, but uh, I think we're getting there. Uh, so the quality of the past performance information, just to sum it up, it's great if you have the compliance rate. We're close to the 80%. Now the heavy drive has to be on the quality input. Uh, we are going to continue that push next year. We'll probably increase the sample size and pay more attention to it. Um, I think uh, we are seeing the benefit. We're also, I think, going to continue our training efforts with our folks and increase the exchange they routinely have with the vendor community so it's not just left up to the formal process, but we're really increasing quality throughout. So if you have any questions regarding Treasury's efforts in the past performance area, please feel free to contact me. Um, I am at eros.cooper at treasury.gov. So feel free to send me an email, reach out to us, and we'll be happy to help. Thank you, John and Iris, for providing such great insight into your leadership um, tactics that you are using to improve reporting compliance within your agencies. Now I'd like to ask you a few questions about what you're doing to improve your reporting compliance. In particular, as an acquisition leader within your agency, you have demonstrated great leadership and taken great interest in ensuring that this function is properly implemented and monitored throughout your agency. What was the main step that you would say really helped to improve your agency's reporting compliance? Um, I believe, Julia, it was really important that I stepped up and paid attention to it. It is part of all of our performance agreements. It's part of our procure stat. It gets reported up and it gets looked at regularly. 
And so the focal point on my team sends out the information, but I pay attention to it and I will follow up. So that makes my bureau leaders follow up as well. That's great to hear. And John, what would you say? Well, I'd say, you know, I touched on it and Iris touched on it. I think, uh, you know, I call these types of things, how do you put stuff on people's radar screens? Mm -hmm. You know, these are the things, as we all know, people tend to focus largely on the placement activities, the awarding the contract. It's all those responsibilities we have to do after the, we award the contract. And as Iris mentioned, that's probably the most important piece of it. You know, are we getting what we bargained for? Are we getting what we paid for? So I think, you know, it's two things, really. The awareness that I talked about, you know, with the agency senior managers. It's the uh, understanding, but it's more importantly giving people the tool to manage it and make sure that it's on people's radar screen. So establishing performance measures, monitoring monthly reporting, quarterly reporting, um, and, and again, the accountability piece to them. Right, great to hear. You also talked a little bit about quality control and how you're making sure that quality is included in your reports. What are you doing to ensure accountability of this function in your acquisition workforce? Making certain that acquisition officials responsible for documenting performance provide meaningful, useful input to the contracting officer or into the CPARS database about the contractor's performance. Harris? Um, again, it is, we have started taking this role on to actually pull a sampling of what's in the, in the database and look at it uh, objectively. Does, is this really helpful and is this useful information? Uh, we have started reporting this as, at our monthly Treasury Acquisition Council meetings. Um, so there is an awareness now, and again, it's like John said, you put it on people's radar screens, you know, you get what you inspect. So we are not nowhere close to where EPA is in terms of the quality piece, but we're certainly driving towards that this fiscal year and the next fiscal year. That's great to hear. And John, do you want to elaborate what you said about quality yeah. control? Yeah, and when I, when I consider accountability, again, I don't look at it as, uh, you know, uh, we need to take a hammer to people because I, I don't think that people don't comply on purpose. Again, I think it's because we don't have a management focus on it. So I think the things that we're doing, you know, with respect to the tools, the training, the guidance, the dedicated staff, we're, we're managing and monitoring it are getting it on people's radar screens, people are appreciating it, and obviously our compliance is, is way up. You know, with respect to accountability, ultimately though, you know, as our contract management uh, system, as I talked about there, you know, delegations of authority to contracting activities, individual warrant authorities, COR warrant authorities, those are all conditioned on people's compliance with this. So, you know, giving them the tools, making sure that we're monitoring and tracking it, making sure that we're identifying the challenges and overcoming that is one piece of it to the extent that, you know, people aren't uh, doing what they need to do with those tools, then, you know, there's always that piece of it to the delegation, tying it to the delegations. Great. It's really good to hear your leadership on this particular effort. Let's also talk a little bit more about past performance reporting compliance, just to hear a little bit more about what your agencies are doing to incentivize your contracting workforce. So even though past performance reporting is a required contract management function, contract administration, as you know, is often the last function to complete. What do you do or do you do anything extra to incentivize or motivate your contracting workforce to perform this function? Iris, let's start with you. Um, I think it's more motivational because I come from the contracting profession. I can stand up there because I know how that feels. We, it's like John said, we're driving to award and then we forget this is when it really starts. Mm -hmm. um, so I encourage my, my COs to really pick up the phone, call the contractor and say, how is it going? Because we don't have that interface a lot. It's more to our technical people. And I think it's important, especially with some newer companies, to get that feedback. Because all of us want to be successful, and I think we're all going to succeed when the contractor delivers quality service or goods. So that early outreach can make the formalized process so much easier. So I think that's my motivation. You know, pick up the phone, make that call. It'll pay for itself in the long run. That's great. John, what about you? Well, you know, we all know that the acquisition community is a tight-knit community, and, you know, I think uh, there is growing, at least I see it in my agency, uh, you know, a, a sense of a growing obligation uh, to make sure that, you know, what we're putting in this system uh, is useful information for others because certainly we want to get that. 
And the more that we are emphasizing the need to use this information, particularly for source selection, Iris uh, talked about that in, in, in her uh, briefing, uh, the more that we're looking for quality, the more that we want to rely on it, the more I think the professionalism of our people are coming through, and they're really wanting to, to do the same. And I see that both in, on the contracting office side as well as in the COR community. So I think, you know, those are, th that's incentive enough, I think, people wanting to do the right thing, wanting to, to do a good job, and, and I see that at EPA, and, and I, I, I know my folks are seeing it from stuff that they're looking at. That's great to hear. Thank you both for joining us today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You've heard from a number of agencies about their best practices, and so I also want to share information from the Department of Energy and Department of Education, some of the practices that they are using to improve their reporting compliance. First, I will talk about the Department of Education. The Department of Education improved their reporting compliance to 82.35%. With that improvement, we asked the Department of Education to share steps they are taking to improve reporting compliance within their agency. And they shared the following steps. One of the steps they are in, have implemented is that they are making sure that grant contract specialists have access to CPARs as a session officials representatives along with the contracting officer representatives. They also train staff on entering quality past performance information. They include CPARs compliance and staff performance plans. And then they also report weekly on the status of CPARs completion. The Department of Education also ensures that their CORs and their contracting officers have a mutual understanding of monitoring responsibilities, and they monitor the fulfillment of these obligations. They have also structured contracting functions to encourage full awareness and establish communication channels within their agency. The Department of Education also ensures that the system includes accurate documentation of contractors' information. They review performance information for completeness and accuracy and make any necessary corrections. Now I would like to share with you the information that the Department of Energy shared with us that they are using to improve their reporting compliance. Unlike most federal agencies that obligate their procurement budgets across a large number of contracts, the Department of Energy obligates approximately 85% of its contract dollars on 36 large management and operating site management and environmental cleanup contracts. The Department of Energy is different from most agencies in that it accomplishes the various missions of its agency through contractors rather than a large federal workforce supplemented by contract activities. The majority of their 36 contracts are cost type in nature and contain either award fee or incentive fee provisions. A number of the contracts also contain award term provisions. Given the large dollar values and importance of these contracts, DOE pays close attention to monitoring contractor performance. The use of management and operating contracts unique to DOE allows their agency to have a much closer working relationship with contractors, thereby facilitating communication and partnering to reach common performance goals and objectives. I invite you to review their practices posted on this ALS website so you can review the details of the steps they are taking to make certain that their workforce effectively uses and documents performance information in the performance systems. Today you've heard some really interesting practices that agencies are using to improve reporting compliance and the information in the system. In summary, agencies have established policies and procedures that demonstrate management's commitment to this process with many managers conducting frequent meetings monthly or quarterly to discuss reporting compliance. They also hold their workforce accountable for performing this function by establishing clear roles and responsibilities for acquisition participants in the source selection process, making sure that past performance information is effectively used, and in the contract administration process, making certain that past performance information is timely documented in the past performance systems with helpful information about the contractor's performance. 
They are also working to ensure reporting compliance is monitored and measured, and evaluation reports are assessed frequently within their agency to ensure that they are not only reporting timely information, but also including quality information in their systems. Many agencies also talk about how they are making sure that their workforce is trained in this area. They're also making certain that their workforce is being transparent with the contractor and communicating performance successes and failures, documenting this information in the performance systems in a timely manner so it can be shared quickly with source selection officials. Thank you for joining today's seminar. Please share the practices you heard and use them appropriately to improve past performance practices within your agency. Our collective attention to this important initiative will improve our acquisition outcomes and deliver more value to the taxpayer. At this time, I want to thank the acquisition officials who participated in this seminar to share their best practices with you. As stewards of the federal acquisition system, we are all responsible for ensuring that we achieve the best results possible from our contractors. My office will continue to work with your agencies to improve the collection and use of quality and timely performance assessments so that agencies can use this information to make the best decisions possible for the taxpayer. Thank you again. That was an amazing overview of past performance and how it impacts the acquisition process. We certainly hope you found today's seminar extremely valuable and useful. Though past performance can come across as a very mundane issue, these presentations serve as a reminder of how vital it is. On behalf of the Federal Acquisition Institute, thank you once again for joining us.